the Department of Defense, um, which is, you know, the department in the U.S. government, which like holds the military and um, they release a, you know, they release like financials every so often and um, they have come to to announce that the post 9-11 wars, um, which have taken place in over 85 countries. Um, so, you know, when we think of the post 9-11 wars, I think a lot of times, especially like, I mean, I'm 26, so I'm not that much older than everyone, but, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, we come to like, I think a lot of the dominant narrative is like these wars have happened in like Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, Syria, Yemen, um, and like a handful of other countries that really come to mind. But uh, our research has shown that this, that the US military has conducted counterterrorism operations in um, 85 countries. So that's over 40% of the countries in all of the world. Um, so in that we've looked at a lot of different research and come to determine that the post 9-11 wars have cost $8 trillion. And the Department of Defense has said that they only cost $1 trillion. So, you know, that's a really big kind of number to comprehend. I mean, $1 trillion would be huge on itself and on its own, but um, $8 trillion really when you take into account every aspect, whether it be like long-term veteran care, fuel for planes, you know, all of the costs from the smallest costs to the largest costs, um, $8 trillion is what we've uh, come to determine is the cost of the post 9-11 wars. And so um, in thinking about that, we also have looked at the human costs. Um, some of the biggest costs have been indirect death, indirect combat. So, um, in terms of war, you know, we think like what, what happens during war? There's combat, there's like training and assistance. That's a big part of the US military's um, like plan when they go to a base in another country um, to train local uh, military and prepare them in their country. Um, and so when you look at death, it's uh, like the human impact of things. It's a lot easier to look at the direct death because it's like absolutely what's directly caused from bombs, from combat, from fighting. And it's important to acknowledge that there's also a lot of indirect death. So through our research, we've found that there are almost a million direct deaths in the post 9-11 war. So that's due to direct violence. But indirectly, the UN has a statistic which says that for every one direct death, there are three indirect deaths. So this is, you know, if you, if there's a drone strike to a country or to an area um, and not only are 10 people killed from that direct strike, but the strike maybe takes out a hospital and then the strike maybe damages some water lines. And then, you know, how many people are not getting the health care and assistance that they need? How many people are without clean water? And then what ramifications does this have? So, um, I mean, it's impossible to put a number on the amount of indirect deaths that the US post 9-11 wars have caused. Um, and I think that's something that really is a key part of the costs of wars work is shedding light on the fact that although there have been many, I mean, many direct deaths, the fact that there have been so many indirect deaths, both from, you know, in like the veteran community in the US and in the local populations that have experienced US intervention, um, we have to acknowledge these things when asking, was it worth it? Was, is it 
is is using military force the best way to go about ending conflict and um historically there have been hundreds of examples in which we've used nonviolent tactics um in which countries have used nonviolent tactics to address conflict and political geopolitical um issues and that's really a huge part of our project is you know why why is war always the answer why is military force always the go to and why do we keep giving money to the pentagon department of defense budget to supply weapons and um people aren't really holding the government accountable so that's what a lot of our research does so um just to kind of give you an idea of like how the process works um because there are like think tanks which often publish research and um, are kind of like hubs of an expertise. There's like activist organizations, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of, like examples of those, but you know, people who are really advocating for and taking action. And then, you know, there's like government policy and congressional action, public policy that can take place in changing like laws, um, you know, affecting uh, budgets, government budgets. So how the Costs of War project works, it's kind of uniquely situated in all of those in that we are, we um, publish research, which is fact-based and evidence-based. And um, so we pull like various scholars and academics to publish research. And then that research is kind of put out into the world and we work with different like activist advocacy organizations um, to try and create change in that way. We do congressional outreach. So trying to impact um, the budget and different public policy around war and um, you know indirect costs and things. And then we do a lot of um, media and journalist work as well. So just trying to really change the dominant narrative and to try and foster some of these conversations around is war worth it is how, what has been the impact of going to war for now you know 20 years 20 plus years um and i'm sure you all know but this is the longest uh u.s war um and the fact i think i think it's pretty crazy that I mean, almost myself included, but the fact that we've, as a country, have been in this war on terror since you were, since before you were born um, is really shocking. And being a young person, younger person myself, and talking to the scholars that we work with, you know, who have gone through like doctorate school and PhDs um, and are now either working in research or, you know, teaching, you know, they talk about how crazy it is to talk to their students in college who don't remember 9-11 and um, have been in war their whole lives. But I think that your generation and um, just younger people in general can really, like there's like an activism that's kind of beautiful in um, so many young people that I've found. And I think it's a really amazing opportunity to question why you've been at war, like why your the U.S. has been at war your whole lives, and to really um, say that sentence out loud is pretty crazy, um, considering that is kind of all you've known. Um, it's it's a hard reality, and it's a reality that I think you know we need to talk about more. Um, and I think too, being young, like. I know that when I think of like anti-war movements in the past, I think of like the Vietnam War. Um, and I've definitely encountered people who have said like, oh, well, the war movement is dead. You know, anti-war movement is dead. Um, there's climate change now and there's like more movements around like social inequality and social activism, Black Lives Matter and um, various things like that. But I think 
something that the Costa of War project does so well is shows that war is an intersectional issue and it's really embedded within so many of these other issues. So like one of our big areas of research and what um, one of the co-founders, Nita Crawford, really specializes in is looking at the environmental costs of war. And so this has direct overlaps with like the climate change movement. Um, and I think like as young people, that's something that it seems like a lot of people have gotten behind is climate change because we're feeling and seeing the direct impacts of that in our daily lives. Um, but the US military is um, the, let me make sure I'm like saying this exactly right. Um, the US military is the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter. Um, and that's something that at least I did not know until I, I started working at Costs of War and doing some more research, but um, the military has huge ramifications on the climate. And, um, you know, even just not only thinking of like greenhouse gases and things, but you think, what are the impacts of like having the bombs dropped on a place and then that's seeping into the soil and how does that affect not only like water supply or water quality, but how does that affect the ability to grow things? How does that affect livestock and cattle? Um, there's a lot of research recently around, one of our contributors has done research around like military burn pits, um, which are these huge pits of just like in the earth that um, because the US war, uh, post 9-11 wars, the war on terror was funded through um, like borrowing and lending and credit card. Um, so I guess to backtrack, previous wars have been funded through taxpayer dollars. And one of the unique thing unique things about this um, time period and this set of wars has been that um, these are like credit card wars. So we are in a deficit. Um, and so there's defense contractors and weapons manufacturers who are profiting off of war. But so a lot of that is um, they have these military burn pits. There's some in the US too. Actually, one of the largest ones is in um, Louisiana, but they have them in other countries as well. So it's cheaper for the military to just throw something into a burn pit. So like a truck, for example, it's cheaper to completely burn a whole truck than like change the tire. Um, because of how this war was funded. So then you have to think how have the how has the pollution from this burn pit affected this local community? And there's a contributor at the Costs of War who has done research on like a lot of the birth defects that have come out of that, both in humans and in animals. Like there have been people in areas close to these burn pits that have had like cows born with two legs or you know different things that affect their whole livelihoods so the costs of war as a project really looks at all of these impacts and really tries to like change that conversation that people are having around why go to war and really who is being impacted by this and you know I think one of the things that comes out of it is like we're all impacted by this um even if you've never had family in the military and you know you've never even like maybe been directly impacted by the post 9-11 wars like taxes are impacted by this um social inequality has risen due to being at a 20 plus year war as a country you know, you look at like student debt, poverty, homelessness, food insecurity, climate change. It's all unfortunately impacted by the military. And I feel like I'm really being so 
it's really hard to talk about. Um, I'm sorry if this is like coming at you really fast um, because it's a lot of information and it's a lot of heavy information. It's hard to hear. Um, I know that. And, but I think that, well, I hope that I am sort of giving information that might be shocking and might be hard to hear. Um, and you can use that to really like push conversation and push discussion with your peers and with um, people that you know in these industries or um, even going to college, like this might impact some of your interests in the future uh, because there are definitely like some of these weapon manufacturers are on college campuses recruiting people because they pay a lot and people have student debt. And sometimes it seems like the only option, but I think really holding these people accountable and holding our government accountable is so important. Um, and there's a lot of really amazing youth movements out there uh, that are doing that. So I hope that this has kind of inspired some interest in this topic. And um, I, I encourage you all to look at some of the costs of wars research and things online. 